thanks for joining us for today's lecture here at the Center for Global Security Research within the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. My name is Asmarat Asketo, and I'm the Associate Deputy Director of the Center. Our guest speaker is Dr. Joshua Schifrenzen. He's an Associate Professor with the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland, and also a frequent commentator on international security and great power relations uh, via a variety of media outlets. His lecture today is entitled Rising Titans, Falling Giants. It's based on his book with the same name released in 2018, where he asserts that relative to rising great powers like China, the United States is in decline. But he challenges the assumption that China's rise presents a predatory threat to the United States and questions the current U.S. strategy on China. He'll present for about 45 minutes and then we'll turn um, to the audience for a Q&A session. So please uh, get your questions ready. Dr. Schiffenson, it's a pleasure to welcome you to CGSR. I'll turn it over to you to get us started. I think you're muted. No, 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 there we are. Thank, thank you so, so much. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, at a prior job, I used to do work with Livermore, and so it's a real coming home experience to be here to present uh, my book. You can see the bright yellow cover on the screen. Again, the book is called Rising Titans, Falling Giants. Uh, how great powers exploit power shifts to give you a flavor of what this is all about. And again, my name is Josh Schifferson. I'm an associate professor at the University of Maryland. And again, um, it, it, I'm privileged to be here. It's a real pleasure. And so I, I'd like to begin though, not with the academic pretense of what an academic book is about, by noting that the policy concern that I'm trying to grapple with, which is to say, one of the central questions of world politics today con concerns the rise of China. And as Asmaret noted, there, there, there are profound concerns in the policy space and academia that a rising, a relatively rising China will almost invariably challenge a declining United States um, through a variety of mechanisms. Some, some better spelled out than others, but a variety of mechanisms. Some argue that China may simply try to subvert the territorial or institutional status quo in the world, in the region, in the world. Others focus on the possibility that China will try to pick off American allies, will pull them into a Chinese sphere of influence. Others claim that China may seek regional, perhaps even global hegemony, all at the United States' expense. And of course, given that a rising China operating, operating in these ways may threaten American interests, there is a growing concern that war may be brewing between a rising China and a declining United States. Now, these are all valid concerns, and, and we don't have a crystal ball, but empirically, we ought to know that there's an immediate, there are some immediate questions on this, because after all, although it's understandable that a that we may worry about a, what a rising China, what a rising state may do, looking historically, rising state strategies vary intensely across time and space. You know, one issue concerns how intensely predatory uh, we might expect a rising state to be, because after all, rising states, if they're trying to continue growing, have pronounced incentives to avoid picking fights with other declining states before they can guarantee their own win. In other words, they ought to be held in check in terms of how predatory they are until they're pretty confident in their own victory. Now, that, that's on the predatory side. But at the same time, if you look historically, there are also notable cases where rising states aren't predatory at all. In fact, they're quite supportive of declining states. So, for example, in the first part of the 20th century, the United States came to Great Britain's support, came to Great Britain's defense in two world wars, and then helped reconstruct Great Britain after the Second World War. Uh, nor to just democracies. In the 19th century, Germany, the rise in the state of the day, really made common cause with the declining Austria-Hungary and helped it stay in the great power competition that defined Europe's 19th century. And of course, in, nor to just in an older time period, in the 1970s, when there were concerns that America was again declining, uh, countries in Western Europe, Japan, and even China at the time, swung into alignment, increased economic cooperation with the declining United States. So, this variation in how rising states behave across time and space, it, it motivates the project. I ask in the book, when a great power declines, what strategies do rising great powers adopt and why? And in particular, when and why do they adopt predatory strategies, strategies that are designed to push a declining state down or perhaps from the great power ranks entirely, versus when do they embrace supportive strategies, strategies designed to keep a declining state around as a great power? And I want to understand not just what strategies they adopt, but also why these strategies change, both in type and in degree across time and space. That's what I'll be speaking to uh, in the rest of this talk. And to give you a preview of the answer, 
I argue that rising states, as some policymakers argue, indeed, indeed seek to expand, but they try to do so cautiously without, without imperiling the power and security they already enjoy. And as a result, they look at declining states not simply as targets, but in a calculating matter. And the more they conclude that a declining state can be useful as a partner to offset other challenges rising states may face, the more likely rising states are to support a declining state. Conversely, when a rising state concludes that a declining state is only going to be a threat, invariably going to be a threat, that's when you're going to see some kind of predatory strategy. And in turn, the choice and degree of predation or support, the choice and change in predation or support, is going to depend on how a rising state calculates a declining state's strategic value, as well as the declining state's own military posture, its ability to push back on the behavior of a rising state or other states. And I'll come back to this later on in the talk. So having done so, ha having given the preview, what am I going to do from here? Uh, after, with this introduction beyond us, I'm going to turn to some concepts and underlying theory. I'll speak a bit to the research design, excuse me, of, of uh, the project. I will then talk to a case study that uh, highlights some of my findings, and then finally speak to some conclusions and policy implications, speaking to uh, what this might mean in particular for American policy vis-a-vis -vis China. So let me turn to the concepts and the theory. Um, the first thing to note is that when I talk about rise to decline, I'm really talking about relative power. You know, power is not measured in absolute terms. Power is measured in terms of how two or more actors compare to one another. And so with that in mind, decline simply means for our purposes, the sustained loss of a great power's economic and military capabilities as hard resources relative to another country, just as rise refers to the sustained growth of a state's economic or military capabilities, again, it's hard power from one state relative to another. Now, these definitions are pretty commonplace, but I want to note that it means that rise and decline, particularly amongst the great powers, occur whenever states grow stronger or weaker. That is, one state can be rising in, in absolute terms, yet still declining in relative terms if another state rises more, just as a state can rise if another one declines in relative terms. So rise and decline are relational concepts, which is going to be very important when we start measuring rising state behavior. Now, Likewise, when I talk about the strategies of rising states, I simply mean a political military ends means chain adopted by a rising state to structure, to give guidance to its relations with a declining state. Uh, it, it's an approach to handling the declining state as another great power in world politics. Now, with this ends means chain in mind, we have to look at two different issues. The first are the goals that a rising state may adopt vis-a-vis -vis a declining state. And by goals, I, I talk about two different types. Predatory goals, where the rising state seeks to weaken the declining state, and supportive goals, where a rising state seeks to preserve a declining state as a great power. Now, that's all very helpful, but it doesn't really tell you how they're going to go about doing this, how, how much they're going to invest. And this is very important when we start talking about the means embraced vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rising states. And so when we talk about the means, I again talk about two different types of means. Um, First, I look at limited means or identify limited means where rising states embrace cautious or circumscribed efforts to affect a decliner's position among the great powers. So when a, this might mean taking low cost or low risk gambits to either sustain or weaken a declining state as a great power. In contrast that with what I could think of as intense means, which are sustained and large scale, expensive, costly efforts to affect a decliner's position among the great powers. Now, putting these goals and means together, the, the, the notion of ends and means together, generates four different ideal types of rising state strategies. On the predatory side of the equation, we can think of relegation strategies, where rising states seek to push the declining state downer from the great powers, a predatory policy, embracing intense means, costly efforts, such as going to war, picking off allies, isolating a declining state diplomatically, engaging economic warfare. These are steps that directly and consequentially and almost immediately shape the quality of life facing a declining state and that require a concomitantly large effort on the part of rising states. Now, that's kind of the classic fear of declining states, the, the, of a rising state adopting a predatory strategy. But there are also less intense predatory strategies, but what I think of as weakening strategies, 
where rising states indeed, indeed seek to prey upon declining states, but they do so using limited means, such as engaging in arms races, refusing to negotiate away conflicts of interest, perhaps offering asymmetric diplomatic demands. These are efforts that are not going to immediately push a declining state down or from the great power ranks, but that make it proportionally harder for a declining state to kind of remain among the great powers. So that's on the predatory side of the equation. Turning to the supportive side of the equation, limited efforts that are designed to keep a great power around, I think of as bolstering strategies. These involve, again, low cost and fairly low effort investments, such as offering token political or symbolic political backing to a declining state, offering limited or conditional kinds of economic aid. These are steps that involve, that, that, that make life somewhat easier for a declining state but that are unlikely to directly and immediately affect its standing amongst the great powers, certainly not going to help it with pronounced economic or uh, military problems that may emerge as decline takes place. Finally, when we start talking about intensely supportive strategies, we can think of these as strengthening strategies. These are high cost, high effort gambits to really prop up a declining state of great power, really keep it around even the face of pronounced problems facing a declining state involving efforts such as offering a declining state diplomatic guarantees, security guarantees, large scale resource transfers in the form of foreign aid, alliance commitments and promising to come to fight for a declining state. These are efforts that protect a rising state, even the face of uh, protect a declining state, excuse me, even the face of an unfavorable international uh, system that help it maintain its security, maintain its economic and military well-being, despite relative losses of capabilities and power. Okay, so with that in mind, how are we to account for shifts in strategy, both in terms across pred predatory and supportive uh, dimensions, as well as in the degree of predation or support? Well, the existing literature in international relations really highlights four arguments. I'll speak to them very briefly. One argument is that it's based on that the issue is based on the security dilemma. That is, the more rising declining states are in a spiral of one another, where each side is taking steps to seek its security, the more likely uh, the states are to engage in predatory behaviors. Whereas the more states can overcome tensions between the misperceptions, misunderstandings, the more likely they are to engage in varying degrees of support. Others, particularly in the 1990s and early 2000s, highlighted the degree of economic interdependence between rising and declining states. The notion being that the more economically intertwined rising and declining states are, the more likely rising states are to support decliners. Others, in a very similar vein, point to ideological similarity, that is, the closer in ideologically or politically states are to one another, the more likely they are to engage in varying degrees of support. Whereas the more distant ideologically states are, the more likely we are to see uh, predatory strategies. Finally, others highlight the importance of leadership beliefs, the idea being that, different that as different leaders come to the fore that have different preferred outcomes for rising and declining state relations, so too does the degree of predation or support. Now, these are all important and often insightful arguments, but I argue, I would argue that they, are, they, they can't explain the empirical reality, as I'll speak to in just a second, just as they're too categorical. They're very good at predicting overarching categories of predatory support, but they fail to really account for variation in the degree of predation or support. And this combination of limitations is where my argument comes into play. I develop an argument in the book that I, that I somewhat grandiosely call predation theory, but that we can just think of as a nuanced approach for understanding when and why and how predatory rising states are and when and why and how predatory or as, how supportive they are. Um, th this approach starts from the proposition that rising states seek power. They indeed want to grow powerful in international affairs, but they do so within limits. That is, they, they absolutely do not want to risk the power and security they already have. As a result, they generally seek low cost and low risk opportunities to expand. And if there is going to, and because they can live, they often live in a multifaceted, multipolar international system, they also would love to buck pass and share the cost of confronting other great power threats that are out there to other countries that are in the world. They don't want to bear all the costs of confronting a third or a fourth or a fifth great power in and of themselves. And this combination of seeking low risk opportunities to expand and sharing the cost of confronting other threats in the system means that rising powers operate, yes, with one eye on opportunities to expand, 
but also seeking to avoid war, particularly with a declining country that may stymie their rise. They try to expand without fostering a countervailing coalition, and they try to expand without foreclosing their possibility excuse me, of cooperating with a declining state that might be a useful ally against a common adversary. In other words, they are keenly aware of the opportunity costs that are involved in simply seeking power over and over and over, even at the, at the expense of the declining state. And as a result, the choice of a change in rising state strategy is going to depend on how interacting with that declining state affects a rising state's own long-term ability to expand. And in particular, it's going to depend heavily on, dec on a declining state's strategic value to a rising state, as well as the declining state's own military posture, its ability to defend itself. Let me speak to each one in turn. Uh, by, um, um, to be more precise, by strategic value, I mean whether a rising state can usefully employ the declining state against other threats, particularly other great power threats that may exist in the international system. Now, this is contingent on four different factors. First, uh, there need to be other great powers in the world. To have strategic value, there need to be other great powers out there. Otherwise, by definition, in bipolar environments, for example, the declining state is the sole threat out there to a rising state. Whereas in multipolar systems, systems with at least three great powers, it's at least plausible that a rising state can use a declining state to get after, to deal with that third great power. Second, a declining state has to be in a favorable geographic position. That is, if a rising state comes to a declining state's assistance, the declining state is geographically able to do something that helps it uh, deal with another great power that is out there. You know, if you're worried about great powers in Europe, it's not very helpful if the declining state is located in Asia, so on and so forth. Third, uh, a declining state has to have some latent potential to have strategic value. Uh, here, I simply mean that if a rising state comes to a declining state's assistance, that the declining state, and please, please forget the language here, that a declining state can be made great again, that it has the capability of playing a relevant role in the great power, among in great power politics, and the rising state wouldn't simply be throwing good resources after bad. Finally, there has to be some plausible domestic base for cooperation between the rising declining state in the declining state itself. That is, there has to be some plausible domestic grouping that if a rising state comes to a declining state's assistance would be willing to bring the declining state into alignment with a rising state. Now, if, if these four factors are all present, if there are other great powers, if a declining state is well geographically positioned, if a declining state has reasonable latent potential, and if there's some domestic support for cooperation with a rising state in a, in a declining state, then I argue that a declining state has high strategic value to a rising state, such that, that a rising state is likely to pursue some kind of supportive strategy. It's likely to try to take the declining state into its orbit, into its, into its sphere of influence, and use it as a proxy, use it as, a, as an assistant against other great powers. Conversely, if some or all of those four factors are missing, then a declining state is likely to offer low strategic value to a rising state such that a rising state is unlikely to see any utility in trying to keep it around as a great power, keep the declining state around as a great power, and allowing it to embrace a predatory strategy, one of those weakening or relegation strategies that I mentioned a little while ago. Now, what this all means is that the degree of support or predation, that, that the, cho the fundamental choice between support and predation hinges on a declining state's strategic value to a rising state. But still, we want to understand shifts in the degree of support or prediction. That is, the choice between bolstering strengthening on the supportive side or weakening relegation on the predatory side. And that's where a declining state's military posture comes into play. By military posture, I simply mean whether a declining state in and of itself can deploy military assets to defend its, defend its core interests of another great power, be it a rising state or another or a third great power out there, begins to challenge it. Uh, broadly speaking, these we can think of military postures as going to two categories. There are states with robust military postures, where they're able to perform requisite military missions to protect themselves. And then there are weak military postures, where states may lack the tools or lack effective tools to protect their interests if another state begins to challenge them. I'm happy to speak more to this in Q&A. 
Now, significantly, military posture can have different effects depending upon the declining state's strategic value. Let me, let me unpack this a little bit. When a declining state has low strategic value, that is, when a rising state is inclined to pursue a predatory strategy, a declining state's military weakness, having a weak military posture, invites relegation, invites really ex extreme efforts or allows for really extreme efforts on the part of a rising state to get after a declining state. After all, in this situation, a declining state would like to make gains at the declining state's expense, held in it only is, and the only reason to not do so is if the declining state itself can push back. And if the answer is that it can't push back because it has a weak military posture, then a, then a rising state can issue a coup de grace, can go after a declining state's vital interest, and really take direct and immediate efforts to push it down or from the great power, great power ranks, leading to a relegation strategy. On the other hand, when a declining state has low strategic value but a robust military posture, this is a situation where even though a rising state might like to make gains at a declining state's expense, Robust military postures make the rising state run scared, to lay low for a period of time. This is a situation that's likely to encourage a rising state to engage in low-cost, low-risk gambits to affect the declining state's military position, with an eye towards eventually being in a spot where it can take any and all advantage in the military posture and, uh, uh, of a declining state and kicks the can down the road for now, but kicks the can down the road for now. Robust military postures make rising states run scared, at least temporarily. Now, that's on the predatory side, but notably, military postures have the opposite effect when declining states have high strategic value. Here, weak military postures invite the mo more extreme efforts to bolster, to support, excuse me, a rising state. After all, in this situation, a rising state would like to support a declining state, would has, has reasons to support a declining state, and would be worried if, it ha if a declining state has a weak military posture, that unless if the rising state comes to a decliner's intensive assistance, the decliner may be picked apart by other great powers that are out there, may be unavailable as an ally in the future, and may be vulnerable to other states' predation. Le add to, to forestall these bads and secure the declining state as a partner, a rising state must intervene in intensive form with, with costly efforts to strengthen a declining state's position amongst the great powers. Finally, when a declining state has high strategic value but a robust military posture, that's when a rising state, even though it might want to support a declining state, is likely to actually hang back a little bit and avoid uh, offering the more intensive kinds of assistance that it might otherwise produce. After all, if a declining state can still provide security for itself, then the need to immediately come to a declining state's backing isn't obvious, just as offering too much support to a declining state that is still able to defend itself might entrap a rising state into foreign conflicts, might look like it's fostering a predatory or aggressive coalition in world affairs and court a counterbalancing coalition. In these situations, robust military postures lead even rising states that would like to support a declining state Hang, to hang back a little bit. The net result is that we can then explain change in rising state strategy, both in terms of type and degree, by looking at how declining state military posture varies across time and space, as well as in terms of how declining state strategic value to a rising state varies across time and space. This is the heart and soul of prediction theory. Now, let me say a little bit about how, with this theory developed, I go about testing it in the volume. I'll speak a little bit to research design, and I'm happy to speak to this more in Q&A. Um, in the book, I look at every case of great power rise and decline in the modern international system, basically since the mid-19th century. I pay particular attention to post-war cases of rise and decline, looking at the Soviet and American responses to Britain's decline, which, as I try to argue in the book, actually saw surprising amounts of American ambivalence towards Britain until British military posture changed, but also equally surprising Soviet support for Great Britain uh, for a surprising long period of time after World War II. And I also look at the American response, <laughs> excuse me, to Soviet decline in the late Cold War, a moment in time when American power was rising rapidly, largely because Soviet power was falling by the wayside. And I'll speak to that case just a little bit in just a few minutes. Yet, in addition to these main cases, I look at the British, German, and Russian responses in particular, uh, but all of them were rising states in some way, shape, or form, 
to the declines of Austria and France in the latter part of the 19th century, focusing again on the 1870 and onward period in the run-up to the First World War. Altogether, I engage in nine case studies that is probably the most comprehensive account or comprehensive survey of rising decline state relations uh, available in the academic uh, literature. Now, I do this, obviously with nine cases, it's not really possible to engage in quantitative studies. Uh, and so instead I really emphasize process tracing and the comparative case study method. I leverage inter and intra case variation in terms of how rising states behaved to test different causal mechanisms at the heart of my story and see if the outcomes track the variables that I predict. And I leverage diplomatic history in a, in a robust and sustained manner by looking at the detailed processes, the decision-making dynamics undergirding rising state behavior to again see if they comport with the arguments embedded in my study. I evaluate in particular speech evidence and policy arguments. I look at the different military, diplomatic, and economic policies adopted by rising states. And I try to see whether changes in these policies, again, track changes in the variables at the heart of my story. Uh, along the way, I draw extensively from uh, archival research. This is uh, me as a graduate student somewhere in the bowels of the Reagan Library in Simi Valley. I do not recommend visiting there if you haven't yet. Uh, I've I looked at well over 7,000 archival documents, filed hundreds of Freedom of Information Act requests, visited a range of American presidential libraries, uh, and I supplemented this archival research with extensive interviews. Uh, so, for example, uh, I collected over 50 interviews with senior American policymakers from the end of the Cold War. Uh, this, for example, is the H.W. Bush policymaking apparatus for foreign policy uh, when it came to Soviet affairs uh, in the early 1990s. And the folks in red are the ones I was able to interview. I wasn't able to interview former Secretary of State Jim Baker, but I was uh, one of the first people given access to his personal paper to Princeton University. The net result is I was able to get very granular insight into policymaking uh, at this moment in time. And so I have great confidence in the ability of the analysis that I offer to actually explain shifts in American policy and shifts, uh, shifts in policy of any great power across time and space. Let me talk a little bit about what I found, focusing in particular on American policy as America rose at the end of the Cold War, becoming the unipolar power of the 1990s and 2000s as the Soviet Union declined. And here we have some famous pictures for, from, from this uh, period. Um, give you a sense of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about American policy as the world went from this. This is uh, Europe at the height uh, in the middle of the Cold War. We see the Soviet Union, the uh, other great power rivals of the United States, and the Soviet alliance system outlined in red, opposed by the NATO allies in blue with the United States offshore. Uh, so I'm going to explain how, what happens as the world goes from this with a with a continent divided to a war that looks like this, a situation where the Soviet Union has broken up entirely, where the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet alliance bloc, has fallen, fallen by the wayside. And in particular, as Germany, which was famously divided in two during the Cold War, reunified and moved and moved entirely into the Western orbit, anchored by the North Atlantic Treaty Organization or NATO. And <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting over a cough. This case is particularly useful because alternative arguments emphasizing the security dilemma, economic interdependence, ideological similarity, or the importance of leadership all offer different uh, distinct predictions of this case for, from my own theory. Security dilemma thinking, economic interdependence, ideological similarity, all leadership lives all predict for various reasons that the United States would become supportive of the Soviet Union even as Soviet decline went ahead at this time period. In contrast, my theory predicts and is unique in predicting variation in terms of America, variation in American predation vis-a-vis -vis the USSR. Because after all, this is a situation where the Soviet Union offered the United States incredibly low strategic value. Uh, during the Cold War, the USSR was the only plausible possible competitor to the United States. It was a bipolar system in uh, IR jargon. And as a result, the Soviet Union, if you look at it in crude geopolitical terms, was the only real impediment that American policymakers were likely to see to American dominance of the international system. As a result, because the Soviet Union was, was really the only competitor for the United States in the world, and we can also see this economically, where the USSR, although much weaker than the United States, was still quite a bit stronger than any other grouping of powers in the world. 
We expect the United States to pursue some kind of predatory strategy with the degree of American predation varying depending upon Soviet military posture, meaning Amer the predictions of this case, of my theory, and the alternatives are, are, are pronouncedly different. Um, and to give you a preview of, my, of the findings, I indeed find that I'm right. This should surprise no one. I'm obviously correct all the time. Uh, in fact, I'm going to argue, though, that American policy vis-a-vis -vis the USSR went through three phases. Uh, in the first phase, the, the United States actually pursued a weakening strategy designed to make low-cost, progressive, sequential gains at the Soviet Union's expense without immediately uh, pushing the USSR down or from the great power ranks. This policy, this weakening effort, though, changed in the dime early in 1990 as the United States pursued a relegation strategy that reunified Germany, the, the, the great prize of the European Cold War, in NATO, and as a result, tore the heart out of the Warsaw Pact, as American policymakers are speaking about internally. Only for American policy to then turn back towards a weakening strategy when, having destroyed the Soviet alliance system, confronted in 1991 with the possibility of a Soviet collapse entirely, American policymakers again stepped back from the brink and pursued a policy of sequential, low-cost gains at the Soviet Union's expense that, surprisingly, saw the United States try to slow roll the Soviet collapse that eventually happened for other reasons in December of 1991. Uh, so let me say a bit more about this. As noted, the United States pursued, in my assessment, a weakening strategy towards the Soviet Union in the early 1980s to mid-1980s. This was a policy that was consistent across the Reagan and H.W. Bush administrations. As American policymakers recognized that, as one policymaker put it, the Soviet Union was in deep trouble, the United States responded by pursuing asymmetric nuclear negotiations, asymmetric demands for the Soviet withdrawal from places like Afghanistan, Cambodia, or the other part of the third world. And even before arms control began, or as arms control began, also look to arms race the USSR in ways that were designed to bankrupt the USSR unless they gave in to American diplomatic concerns. Uh, as Colin Powell, then the National Security Advisor to President Reagan put it in late 1987, American policy was to extract a solid price from the USSR in terms of stabilizing and verifiable arms reductions, protection of the strategic defense initiative, and an end to Soviet foreign aggression and human rights abuses, essentially creating a system that was favorable to the United States and injurious to the USSR, but that wasn't going to affect the core position of the USSR in the international system. This policy continued even as uh, unrest spread in Eastern Europe in the second half of the 1980s, where rather than pushing for an immediate Soviet withdrawal from the Warsaw Pact and an end to Soviet influence over Eastern Europe, American policymakers pursued a gradual strategy, as fa fa famously leading to American policymakers trying to keep communists in power, such as in Poland, where American strategists designed a, a system to keep uh, Soviet President Jaruzelski, a communist in power, even as the Solidarity Democratic Movement began taking off. America tried to slow roll the state of change in the region. This was particularly important uh, given that there were concerns that the Soviet Union might intervene, a point I'll come back to in just a second. And as this effort went forward, the United States tried to slow the pace of German reunification, slow the possibility of German reunification for fear of antagonizing the USSR. And indeed, this fear of the USSR was, was at the heart and soul of American policy at this time. Because even though the USSR had low strategic value and the Americans spoke about gaining American ascendancy, trying to bring about real change in Moscow's approach to the world, in the words of George Shultz, the Secretary of State, and, there, and although American policymakers looked to improve US security by rolling back the Soviet presence in Eastern Europe, by taking advantage of the situation to reduce options for future Soviet leaders, as H.W. Bush's Secretary of State Jim Baker put it, despite this low strategic value, Soviet military posture was quite robust. The Soviet Union had over 600,000 troops in Eastern Europe, and there were real concerns over how far the USSR could be pushed before the USSR pushed back, which in context meant waging a, inaugurating a crisis and perhaps going to war. As one policymaker put it, American policy was designed to, quote, keep the Russians behind us, but not so far that they become dangerous. There were limits to how far the United States was willing to go to push the USSR around at this time. As H.W. Bush himself put it, the Soviets could always stop or reverse changes and all get a crackdown that might lead to a crisis or even worse in East-West relations. And there were worries that if a crisis began, it might escalate 
to truly uh, scary proportions. As Brent Scowcroft, the National Security Advisor, put it in late 1989, as changing Eastern Europe was gaining momentum, the instrument of last resort was still available to the Soviet Union, and there are no guarantees the Soviet Empire will go quietly into the, into the night. And all the war games over the years, the most convincing scenario for a European Central Front war has been a Soviet military act of desperation. There were real worries, in other words, that the, Soviet, that the Americans could not exploit Soviet weaknesses to Soviet problems as far as America might like for fear of triggering World War III. Now, this policy changed on a dime at the start of 1990 when, following the collapse of the Berlin Wall in November of 1989, Germany, the great prize of the Cold War, was unexpectedly unified with the NATO, with the United States striking a deal with West Germany to maintain German fidelity to NATO, and in doing so, isolate the Soviet Union from the reunification process, and even the face of Soviet pushback, Soviet pronounced statements that this was a vital Russian, a vital Soviet interest that could not be trifled with, that the United States was going to eliminate East Germany, tear the heart out of the Warsaw Pact, and steal what was called the jewel of the Soviet crown, in order to incorporate the premier Soviet ally into the Western camp, we had a policy. We had policymakers come up with a list of, of uh, policymakers come up with a list of pref preferred outcomes from German reunification at this moment in time. Germany and NATO was considered the most uh, the best possible outcome for the United States. At the start of 1990, no policymaker expected the United States was going to be able to get it. And nevertheless, by the end of the year. Germany had been reunified with the NATO, and the Soviet Union was in fast to treat the Warsaw Pact was fragmenting overnight. The United States helped structure the collapse of the Warsaw Pact. Now, why is this? Well, on the one hand, why, why this relegation strategy? Certainly, it's the case that the Soviet Union had low strategic value, uh, with policymakers recognizing that this was an opportunity for the United States to achieve, quote, a fundamental shift in the strategic balance, particularly in Europe. So the United States was indeed focused on predation, something consistent with the, with the USSR still offering low strategic value. But significantly, that Soviet military posture, which had been so robust throughout the preceding decade, unexpectedly turned weak in 1990. Uh, this is largely a result of the 1989 Eastern European revolutions, which undercut the Soviet military position in Europe as Soviet forces could no longer be guaranteed secure lines of communication, as local populations began rising up en masse against the Soviet presence, leading the USSR to be unable to use force in Eastern Europe. And indeed, American policymakers recognized the trend at the time. As Condoleezza Rice, then the senior National Security Council uh, advisor in the Soviet Union, put it in early 1990, the Soviets would not even threaten the Germans if the United States began pulling West Germany into, uh, excuse me, pulling East Germany in, in, towards the West. Later that year, uh, senior national security advisors, NSC officials from, uh, argued that, that if the Soviets pushed back, the U.S. could simply, quote, remind Gorbachev that his troops are fast being pushed out of the region, such that the Soviets would have to take whatever the Americans were willing to offer. And by the end of the, by within a few weeks, Rice again was talking about how the Soviets are unable to re-extend their tentacles into Eastern Europe. In other words, at a moment in time, the Soviet Union simply lacked the military wherewithal to protect itself. The United States drove forward, exploited Soviet problems, and pulled the premier Soviet ally into the Western orbit. Now, you might think that having relegated the USSR in 1990, the United States would be happy to take advantage of Soviet collapse, the looming Soviet collapse in 1991, as unrest spread to the USSR itself, and it became a real question over whether the Soviet Union would hang together as a country. Yet, in fact, the United States returned to a weakening strategy, pulled back on the scope of its predation in early 1991. This was a moment in time when, in the fight between the Soviet center under Mikhail Gorbachev and different republics, Soviet constituent states that were trying to break away from a center uh, under people like Boris Yeltsin and beyond, the United States opted to back a weak Soviet center. Didn't want to keep a strong Soviet Union together, but also didn't want to see the country collapse entirely. Uh, in fact, as Skokrov put it to Bush, you will want to reassure Gorbachev that you, we do not want the disintegration of the USSR. Uh, the U.S. certainly pushed initiatives to devolve military power to different republics, but at the end of the day, the idea 
was to slow the Soviet dissolution and ensure a peaceful landing for the USSR, such that the USSR wouldn't collapse overnight or overly rapidly. Now, why was this? Well, on the one hand, it's certainly true that by encouraging a weaker USSR, a, a, a less unified USSR, the US was creating conditions that would be beneficial to itself over the, over the long term. The USSR would be a third rate military power, is what analysis, analysis put it, if the Soviet center weren't so strong in the future. But at the same time, there were real concerns with the Soviet Union's ability to protect itself, to protect its core interests at this moment in time, because the Soviets maintained a robust nuclear posture. It couldn't project power outside its borders, but it could protect itself at home, largely because of the nuclear arsenal. And this fear of the Soviet Union using their nuclear arsenal to protect themselves was also overlaid with concerns over the domestic political arrangements in the USSR and how this would intersect with the nuclear enterprise. A constant question, as Bob Gates once put it, was how much pressure the Soviet system could take without a hardline or a riotous backlash, which could erase many of the internal and external changes. There's a pronounced concern that the US pushed the USSR too hard at this moment in time. Hardliners could take charge and either initiate a nuclear crisis, swag with nuclear weapons, or simply try to coerce states around its periphery into giving the, US, into giving the USSR what it wanted. In other words, the Soviets could protect themselves using threats of nuclear blackmail, and there was a question for what the Soviet internal apparatus would allow for. Likewise, when discussing why the US wanted a Soviet Union to hang together, Jim Baker in his personal notes noted, we want centralized control of nukes. We don't want to encourage republics to become active players in the nuclear issue. Don't undercut the Soviet center on this one issue. Don't send the message that, quote, we want nuclear pluralism, or we want the center to disintegrate on the nuclear issue. There is value in the American assessment, in other words, to keep to uh, keeping the W no in charge in the USSR, because the Soviet Union, which was able to destroy, which had the wherewithal to destroy the world using its nuclear arsenal, was at least something that the US knew how to deal with. This was insufficient to prevent the collapse of the USSR. The American effort to slow the impending dissolution of the USSR was unsuccessful, and the USSR collapsed on Christmas Day of 1991. But this was not for want of American trying. So to step back, I would just want to summarize what we found. Uh, I showed that American strategy varied in the Soviet case in a very short period of time. That the United States showed that our, that, our, that uh, American predation expanded and contracted the Soviet posture changed. That this was that this finding of predation and variation in predation is inconsistent with competing accounts. But that leaders instead argued about security, pursued power, and pursued American interests in line with the arguments developed in my book. Let me step back in the last few seconds and talk briefly about some conclusions and implications. Um, again, to recap, I've argued in the study that rising state strategy depends on how a declining state affects a rising state's security, in particular, its likelihood of gaining a partner against other threats or going to war with a declining state. I've argued that rising states may want power, but they're still cautious in pursuing that power. They're not out for, with bated breath for international conquest. And that alternative accounts of rising state strategy seem to offer less insight in terms of accounting for their course and conduct of rising state behavior than policymakers and many analysts often claim. I'm suggesting <clears throat> that the most draconian fears of rising states, that they're out for global hegemony and will tomorrow try to challenge American power and influence, just don't seem to work historically across the empirical record. Now, this is implications for IR theory, in particular highlighting how competition and cooperation in IR theory may develop. I'm happy to speak more to this in Q&A. But it also suggests that the United States, when it comes to the rising China, to return to the policy question that motivated the study, that the United States may be overstating uh, the intensity of Chinese ambitions, intent, uh, overstating the intensity of American problems to be to be China. Not only is it likely that China will be a cautious and constrained riser as it deals with a complicated geopolitical periphery, as it deals with an uncertain uh, uh, the desire to continue avoiding conflict with a still military powerful United States, but that the United States itself is playing a very strong hand. Not only does the United States have military tools to push back on any Chinese predation gambit, but because China is rising in a complicated geopolitical milieu with countries like India, Japan, and in the future, perhaps even Russia, all uh, opposed to China's rise, 
it's very plausible that if the U.S. plays its cards right and is able to manipulate Chinese incentive structures, it may be able to even galvanize some kind of Chinese support for American national interests. So the U.S. is playing a strong hand when it comes to China's rise, and it ought to be proceeding with that in mind. So with that, let me uh, take any questions, comments, concerns you may have. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. That was um, a great explanation of your book and uh, the framework behind it. Um, we appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, so now we're going to move to the Q&A session. Um, so we have about um, a little less than 45 minutes for that. So start, you know, raising your electronic hands and also typing your questions into the chat. Um, and just to remind everyone, or if anyone's new to the Q&A sessions for CGSR, they are Chatham House rules, so we don't 